Hey guys, uh, welcome. Just today I'm just going to give you a beginner talk on Rx Swift. Just it's going to be very basic, mostly example driven, and we'll just see how it, you can actually use it in iOS apps. And mostly, what well, most of what I say today is going to apply to any language that you decide to use Rx in. So we'll get into that a little bit later. So Rx is actually stands for Reactive Extensions. So the first question we're going to ask is, what is reactive programming? So the one-line answer from, this is from Rx website, is reactive programming is programming of asynchronous data streams. Now, that really doesn't mean much for those who are not unfamiliar with the topic. So let's just get to what Rx actually is, and I'll sort of try to explain it based on examples. So Rx is, it's just a sort of Rx introduces a certain set of concepts and tools that lets you abstract over anything that's event driven or asynchronous. So, for example, I/O streams, um, or in fact, anything else that's event driven, even HTTP networking, and anything that's local to the system. Now, in, obviously, in Swift and iOS, you have something known as key value observing, so it abstracts over that as well. Now. And it abstracts over it through something known as an observable, which is effectively a sequence. So in fact, what is a sequence? A sequence is an array. Think of an array, an infinite array that gets populated with items over time. Now, what can you do to an array? You can map over it, you can filter, reduce, concat, merge, do a bunch of stuff that you can actually do on an array. Is what is a sequence. So it's effectively a, an array that is filled with values over time. So yeah, you can do all of this, all of the standard array operators on it, and Rx obviously comes with the standard ones as well as like, some additional operators that you can actually use and actually build yourself to merge and categorize and do whatever you want to them. So they also have the guarantees that regular, regular arrays provide, which, may, which is effectively order of execution, pretty much. So, if you have an array and you map over it, you know that the order of execution is going to follow the index, first item, second item, third item, so on. And that's the same guarantee that you get from the observable. How many of you are familiar with promises? Actually, yes. Wow. All right. So an observable is, uh, is just promises on steroids, pretty much. So what you, have, what you get with the promise is you pass in an, an async value, and at some point in the future, you get a result. But that it only represents one value. An observable does the exact same thing, but it does it for future values and infinite values, as and when you sort of trigger the observable. Um, but the downside with promises is if you have two or, two or more promises, you actually don't have any control over at what time, over which, what time and what order they're executed in. So, for example, you could have two promises in an array, and you have no idea which one is going to come back with the result first. So these are certain guarantees that you can get from an observable, um, or effectively a sequence. So it sort of introduces two, I guess you could call it, uh, classes. One is an observer, and then one is an observer, and the other is an observable. So the observer is a class that watches for changes and pushes data. So any abstract, uh, say for example, file of this, this guy, you want to abstract over it you have an observer that watches for the disk I.O. and triggers events based on um, these particular statuses surrounding those, uh, surrounding the file system events. So there are three types of events in Rx, and only three. That's the next event, completed, and error. So the first, as soon as you connect, the first value that's sent through is sent as next, and every, obviously every subsequent value is also sent through a next event. When the observer, when you reach the end of the sequence, or the end of the array in this case, or the end of the observable, you get a completed, um, a completed event, which just sort of stop, stops the observable and cannot continue anymore. It's a dead end. You have to restart the observable somehow, or create a new observable. Then there's the error event, which it, at, at any point during the course of the of the uh, observable, if there's any error whatsoever, say for example something happened to the disk, or networking error, or whatever, that the observer is responsible for, it cascades through as an error event, and you can capture it at one spot at the bottom of the chain. So, and they're also, all the, they're also lazy and immutable and all the good stuff. Uh, so just, uh, how many of you are familiar with Haskell, Stream, I.O.? Okay, so yes, effectively, 
for those who are familiar, it's probably this was um, I guess inspired by Haskell and how they do it, the stream I am. So why would you actually use Rx? So you in many languages there are actually other abstractions over the exact same idea. The only reason you use Rx is because there's a platform. There's an implementation for most of the major platforms. So there's JavaScript, Scala, you name it, they'll have it. If it's not there, they'll probably be coming out with something along those lines. So yeah, that's and the the biggest benefit is if you model a solution in one language using Rx, it'll be applied. You can apply the exact same logic in different languages and get this exact same result. They won't change because of the observable contract. So let's get to some actual code. So this is Xcode. Ignore um, Xcode or whatever the whatever I'm introducing here in terms of code is a, is applicable to. Absolutely. Why do you get please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about that? Yeah, yeah. Further in there. <laughs> <laughs> Even more. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit small for the camera, too. So. There you go. Uh, more presentation. Presentation <laughs> harder. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So, what do we have here? We ha this is just an export playground where you can play with Swift code. Um, so whatever I'm doing here applies to all the other Rx languages. So if I can do this here, you can do somewhat, something similar with other Rx based, other Rx implementations. So to start off the example, uh, we've got two, well, let's just ignore the first one. We, we've got something known as a behavior subject. So, sorry. Oops. Let me. So a behavior subject in Rx is something that has the properties of both an observer and an observable. So let's not get too much into what a behavior subject is because that's not really actually relevant to what we're doing. I just use it to show examples and whatnot. And you'll actually find that most of the time you'll never use behavior subject anyway. So, um, let's, so let's just go through what, an actual, what Rx actually is. So let's assume we have a value called A. Now, if I do a dot subscribe next, uh, and then just print that value. You'll see that in the console here, down there, you actually have whatever I've printed at the top, which is just one. Now, that's obviously not very useful. Let's introduce another value to it, which is three. So the on next is effectively sort of mimicking a next event, and then sending three along as the value for the next event. So internally, the Rx value, the sequence for that is actually an array of 1 and 3. And you'll notice that when I actually subscribe at the bottom, there's actually 1 and 3 next, uh, down here. But it's being subscribed at the top. So you can actually have call these events from anywhere on, the, on that behavior subject, and it'll start you know, obviously containing those values. So what else can you do with it? Now you can, you can map over it. Uh, and to and so now it's just adding two for every value. The, the, beauty, the beauty of this approach is that you can actually, because they represent future values, you can just prescribe a series of actions to happen on those values and they'll happen without you having to actually call them. So most of the code that you actually write uh, in, in imperative style would usually be uh, I've, I've got this bunch of data, call this function on that data and do something, and call function on the result, do something, call function, and so on. It's, just, it's an endless array of calling functions manually. As long as you have a stream that describes the behavior of what has to happen to each sequence of data, you will have that exact same chain flowing through. So what actually is happening here um, is that when the, it's starting with an initial value of one, it's mapping over it, it has a value, and then it reads three. It obviously does it in order, doesn't? If each, I can put the a dot on next, uh, or it is enable that, and it does three, five, and seven uh, when you add plus two. So it follows the order. It, there's always a guarantee order of execution. It won't do one before the other at any point in time. In any case, now uh, let's, for example, say let me introduce another one called b. Let's look at this. 
right. So, like we did before, let's we, we can actually do filter and map and reduce and all sorts of stuff on the sequence of arrays. So if I say want to filter out just three from the subscription that you get at the bottom, um, you will actually get that value. Now, if you notice, let's oh, let's put this here. So you'll notice that it's actually printing out three here, but it's not printing out three when I put the subscription at the bottom. Anyone have any idea why that is happening? Yeah. All right, so. This is your program to execute until you. Well, not necessarily. So when you actually, when I'm doing a dot filter here, um, it's, it's a, a actual value at this point at of a is already six, I mean five. So it never sees the three because you subtract to it after so the next value. default null subscription that would just ignore things? Uh, it really doesn't block up until you subscribe the first time? Yes, there are operators to prevent that. So there's one called share replay, which you can actually record, let's say share replay five, and it'll record the most, the, three, the most current five values and play them back. But those are things that you can actually figure out once you go through the ReactiveX documentation, pretty much. Yeah. So does that mean you can move lines 18 and 19 up to line 10 if yeah. you work correctly? Yes. OK, fair. fair. So actually, let's do that right now. I'll move it up here. There you go. Ooh. Oh, uh, like, it doesn't make a difference if it's on line 14 instead, like after you've got three. Well, line 14. If you put it between the two. Would, yeah, between, what, what difference would that make? Would that make any? No? Uh, but you mean you put it between 13 and 14? Yeah. Well, if you do that... Um, um, oh, so it's still great. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, as long as it sees the value 3. Okay. The only problem happens when you put it after... Uh, yeah, if you put it on after the 3, uh, I mean after the 5, okay. it never sees the 3 anymore because at that point the latest value that it, think it sees is only 5. Okay. So obviously when you actually filter it, when you it only starts the sequence when you start watching for it, which is a subscription. That's how the whole lazy thing works, because because it's lazy, it doesn't see anything else until you actually need it. Um, so let's just, I'll leave that function uh, there. All right, so I'll just leave the tool today. All right, so there are a couple of other operators that you can run on them. So one of, these are just custom operators that Rx introduces. Um, to sort of make the life easier. One is the combined latest operator, which is actually here. So ignore the slash t's, I've just put it in to sort of help readability and so on. Um, you actually don't need it. So what's actually happening here, I'm actually getting 30 as a value um, when I'm actually doing it. So what I'm obviously multiplying the first value and the second value. So if you see the value as 30, you'll notice that it's the product of 6 and 5. Now, the, whatever I said before also applies. So if I actually just do p on next 8, the products change. Because at that point, it's 8 into 5. So that's, and it always only looks at the most recent value. So I can actually put this at the top. Uh, yeah. And it gives me an entire range. Every time I trigger an event, it sees that as the latest, and then executes it for that particular value. So it, it sees both 3, 5, 4, 6, and 8, and runs them all for each individual event. So obviously, the place where you put it is sort of important. But in most cases, you'll put the subscription at the bottom, and then the chain will just run itself most of the time. We'll get into more details around that later. So next, the next operator is the zip, which is how many of you are familiar with what the zip does? OK, so it just takes, a, they, if for a sequence of the same length, it takes one from the first sequence, the one from the first, uh, the item at the first index of the first sequence, and the item at the first index of the second sequence, and then merges them together. And then you use your merge of functions to sort of do whatever you want with them together. Right now, I'm just adding them together. So I'm actually getting zip 13, which is 8 plus 5. <laughs> 
At this point, all it sees is the eight and five for obvious reason because you're subscribing to it after eight and five. All the other values have gone through. Now let's see what happens if I do eight part. And see, so I just enable that as well, that one as well. So zip's actually fifteen at the moment, which is eight plus seven. Now if I do a dot on next two, you'll notice that zip is still fifteen because it has there's no equivalent value on the other observable because it's a zip. So if I do b dot on next three, then you've got another zip trigger for five. So this sort of shows you how you can actually use these sort of sequences for something. Well, these obviously don't are, don't reflect what you actually see in real life, but um, this is sort of an example of how an observable works. If you added another a dot on next, or mm -hmm. the b dot on next, does it use? No. Uh, yeah, okay. So oh, it, I can just change it, that to something else. Yeah. yeah, so does it just buffer values? Well, as to, to zip? At, the, at the point of subscription, the key obviously has a buffer on both sides, and then the length has to match up. Yes. Um, so if you obviously if I subscribe at the bottom, if I move that down there, all all it will see is eight and three, or in this case, um, five and three, <coughs> and sort of print out eight. So at the point of if you put it at the top, very top, before all of this stuff happens, it'll see the entire series of changes. Um, and print out a value from each individual, each individual combination of zip. So zip is actually quite useful. Yeah. Why do you get the same result if you put it at the bottom as well? That what you're getting there? Print out the data or no? No, you don't. So I'll actually I'll get rid of the combined layers. It's probably confusing for a few people. Um, if I take, so if you see that, there's actually uh, five different values for zip. I'll put that at the bottom. And you only have one value because it only sees the most recent value. Uh, so, yeah, I see. Yeah. Is it binary or can you, is it very out of Can you zip three things apart? Uh, in RX, right now you can only zip two. I'm assuming it's. But you just standard. cascade. You can keep cascading them through, yeah. So, well, some people, what, I mean, in R, in, purely in Swift land, what you typically use is you use zip to, say, for example, take uh, input from two different input fields sort of concatenate them together to get some sort of logic around it. Usually uh, the username password fields, they have logic around of the username has to be this length plus the password and then they hash based on the username and so on and so forth. So there's insane number of users for it. Um, but yeah, it's just handy to see what you actually can do with it. So let's uh, let's get into some actual examples. Uh, this created three sort of dummy apps. They actually don't do much of anything, but they sort of highlight practical use cases for Rx. Um, this is a simple, oh, I've got a typo there. That's a simple login form, not logic form. All right, so, yeah, forget, forgive me. So I've, I've put in some basic rules here, which says that without, if, unless the username field and the password field has some sort of content on it, the submit button isn't enabled. So I can type something in there, and I can just type in one character on the submit button's name. You'd think that, I mean, this is you know easy enough behavior, and you'd think, you know, hey, Swift, you can do this you know, in trivially in two lines, but no. So in Swift, what you'd have to technically do is bind event handlers from both the username field and the password field onto the uh, controller, and sort of have maintain state outside the scope of that, uh, outside the scope of each function to sort of check what the latest value is and so forth. It's totally messy and you know not really worth it. Let's look at what the actual code that we ended up with looks like. So in view did load I'm all I'm calling all I'm doing is calling the view logic function that does nothing, just calls this function. So we've got a we've got two fields, the username field and I'll just go up again. We've got the username field, password field and the submit button. So it's just three actions, or uh, three outlets. In the fifth speak, outlet is effectively something that just attaches to the view and talks to the view. So you, that actually represents the uh, what you see, the actual value of what you see on the screen, which is username and password. 
All right. So what, I, what do I have here? Rx comes with a library, Rx Swift, especially comes with a library called Rx Coco, which just reads, which is sort of, sort of an extension for Rx to Coco, which is the UI kit in Swift, and sort of gives you just functions that sort of return streams by default, so you actually don't have to manually create an observer and observable for all of this. So what do you what do you have here? You've got a property called Rx test, Rx text, which returns an observable of the values within the username field. So if I just put a debug statement in there, um, and one minute. There you go. So I can just type it along, and you'll notice that there's a next event with each tag right type. It throws the next event with the value that's contained within it. So uh, what am I doing here? I'll just get rid of that debug. I'm taking the user input from both the username and password. I'm mapping over it to get the count of characters in those in the username and password. And just in, oh great. Sorry. Yeah. So in the results selector here, I'm combining values from the latest values from the username count observable. So the, let's uh, the let's just let me just remind people what I mean, tell people what the dollar sign that signifies. I come from a JavaScript background, and in JavaScript, the username dollar signifies username observable. It's just something Rx convention in JavaScript. Um, I just choose to use it here because it sort of makes things very clear what the property is, whether it's an observable or just a regular value. It's a string of usernames rather than a string of characters. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. So you've got the, the so you I sort of read it as username observable, password observable, username count observable, and so on. So we've got two observables here. I've just mapped over all the values that could be could potentially be username and got the count of that. Same does for the password. And then I'm combining those two streams together, the latest values from those streams, and then checking which ones has which one's length is more than zero. Say, and then if they are, then I just pass in a boolean, a return a boolean, pretty much, and just enable the button based on that. So this result selector here, you can do whatever you want to it. You can say username count has to match this, has to you know satisfy this regex function to, for complexity purposes and so on. And everything's sort of taken care of at that point, and the submit button simply uses it enabled. And based on the result of that, you can do a whole host of UI activities, uh, sort of showing a notification, having a tick mark next to the field, you know, whatever takes your fancy, and sort of do it here. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much how the combine latest works. So it's a practical use case for combine latest, and you probably use combine latest all over the place. Um, so let's go to the next example, which is not really much of an example, it's just an empty screen, but it sort of highlights something that's very specific to Rx, which is a disposable. Every observable, once it's started, unless it's been deliberately stopped or completed or errors out, doesn't stop. It runs forever. So you have to, if you actually leave a view, so if I go back now, actually, let's start this again. I've set up a timer in main .story, or sorry, in main view controller. It's sort of just in uh, in, I, in iOS we have something called a notification center that just has some timers and all that. So I'm every second, once every second, I'm just posting a notification called ticker, and I'm listening to it in the notification disposable using RX. So RX has a RX notification uh, extension to the notification center, which sort of trigger returns an observable of uh, of type of this particular notification. So um, printing trigger, ticker trigger every time you go to that view. So when I open up that view, you'll notice there's a time, obviously. Uh, I have to run that, sorry. I apologize. So I've got it tickering, ticking away once every second. You'll notice that there's no actual logic anywhere to actually stop this observable. So if I leave the page, it's still ticking, it, because no one's actually told it that it needs to be stopped. Now the typical way you'd actually do it in, uh, or in iOS, you have cleanup functions that you usually do when you have the view did, un view did unload function, which is effectively when you move away from the page. But uh, all of that is very messy. So in, in Rx world, well, how you'd actually dispose something, something that you've subscribed to is say, you can just do let 
a disposable is equal to that, and just call disposable. Uh, and that effectively oops, that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fail. All right. So you have, you just have to call the disposable function. And what do we have here? Uh, no, that's not dot. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Sorry. Disposable dot dispose. There you go. So when I call the dot dispose function on any subscription or the value of the result of the subscription, you actually stop it. So now if you actually notice I've actually put put this in the views logic function itself. So going there won't do anything because I'm subscribing and disposing it immediately, which is what that section is. So now, obviously, this is not very practical, which means you have to actually maintain state wherever you go. Where that is, you have to create the disposal value in the class somewhere and manually, when you unload the view, sort of have manually dispose it. So in Rx, as part of the Rx Coco framework, you have something known as the add disposable too. So you create a class variable called dispose back, or actually called whatever the hell you want, as an, inst as an instant or instance of dispose back. And then you can just call the dot add disposable to function at the bottom, which is here. And what will happen is when you move away from the screen, um, this vari variable gets deallocated as usual. And Rx will see that and deallocate all of the uh, attached subscriptions to it. So let's just see what happens. I've got a notification going here. It's clearing off. I go back, and it's stopped. Because the, it's properly disposed of by looking at the disposed back function. So it's, this is just some sort of, I mean, this is sort of very important to remember, because this is explicitly a problem. This is a big problem in iOS, with leaking resources everywhere. People forget to clean up stuff. And it's just, it's just a mess. Um, this sort of particular dispose logic is present in many Rx implementations, so you'll find it very useful. Um, let's go to the uh, third example, which is sort of a more realistic use for the uh, for Rx. It's a more complex UI. I mean, some people here have seen this before. This is what better than that last one. Yeah. So well, let's keep it that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, so this is a just a basic example of a page with a refresh button and three placeholders. What this does is it hits the GitHub API, picks up random bunch of users, and puts them in three avatars. That's it. It's very and obviously renders their avatars, which means it fetches the avatars as well. So very basic, but then it's sort of it's a little bit complex to sort of show you what to sort of mimic what a real life app would be, right? So what, I, what, what does this do? When I hit refresh, it reloads the list of users from GitHub and gets a fresh set. So every time I hit that, it's getting me a fresh set. I can also close each individual user, and it loads another one from the local list of users that is pre-downloaded when I hit the refresh button. So every time I hit that, it's just, it's just another user from the list. It's, just, it's taking time to re-render because it's fetching the image for them. So. It's a, bit, it's a bit slow, but if you'll notice that once most of the images are caged, they get they start speeding up. Aussie geek. Yeah. All right. So let's just go through some of the code here. I'm just going to. Yeah. There you go. Right. So now I've sort of disabled a fair few pieces of the code, and this sort of renders nothing. Let's just go step through the code and see what actually happens. So I obviously have uh, avatar one, label one, close one, which obviously attacks the avatar here, the label and the close button. And there's just one for each of those, two and three. And then there's a refresh button at the top. Um, that's here. So let's just go straight to the view to load. Ignore this bit. All I'm, I, iOS surprisingly doesn't provide an X button by default, so I just put a plus button in the rotated by 45 degree. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just ignore that. Um, all right, so let's just go back to the uh, view logic function. Rx has extensions to for buttons called the Rx tap, which sort of triggers and observe an event when someone taps a button. Very easy. Now, if you'll notice, I'll just put a dot debugs 
Sorry, I have a debug statement there. Cool. So, yep. So every time I hit that, it's clicking, it's loading that. Ignore the rest of the cap, it's just, yeah, ignore the event next click and so on. Because they, what I'm mapping through when I actually click it is click. So you'll actually, you'll sort of notice why I'm, that I'm actually mapping through and returning a string in all these places. So Rx tab by default returns a void, which sort of is actually pretty useless. And I turn it into a string because that way, if I ever have to debug this sort of this sequence later on, I can just log every step and I'll actually have strings to sort of represent what they are. So I, the underscore in Swift just ignores the whatever parameter that's passed through and then I'm just returning a click which is what that is, which is a string. Um, every time we have some UI event, I just return some sort of readable string that I can actually use. All right, so let's get started on what the actual code is. So there's, there's the, re the refresh observable, which is when you actually press the refresh button, it actually maps over that string or whatever it returned and returns a random number. It doesn't actually do anything with the string, obviously. It returns a random number between zero and thousand, and I put, create an NS URL based on it. Oops. There you go. Ah, yeah. Create an NS URL based on it. So it just talks to GitHub's API and says users in some random number. And that's how I'm actually fetching those users. So there's an actual representation of that. That would be, that's exactly what's happening. This is known as a marble diagram in Rx. So the, the refresh button's that observable. So when I actually press that, it, it creates a request. It triggers a request observable, which then fetches the response from the response observable and sort of shows it here. This doesn't really make much sense, but it will once I sort of explain uh, what a marble diagram is. Yeah. What happens if the response does never come back? Like say it times out for some reason. So there are operators you can there you can set up to say if if it, in this case if it times out to throw an error and the whole sequence sort of fails, um, which you can then handle gracefully or crash hard depending on how you want to do it. Um, most of the time, the default timeout on these uh, networking requests are set to infinite, especially in iOS, unless you explicitly specify a timeout. I've actually done that at the top and setting it to 15 seconds. Otherwise, I'll just stay idle for freaking ever. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so if it times out, sort of throws an error. I wish I'd actually prepared an example that sort of deliberately threw an error, but we'll, we can mock something out. Um, so, what am, I, what am I doing? So when the refresh observe, when I press the refresh button, obviously I've created a URL. That's all the request observable is. Just creates a URL. The rest, what's the response observable? Response observable just takes the latest value from. You notice that there's no subscription here anywhere, or you won't see anywhere in this screen. Simply because I'm just sort of merging and concatenating streams at this point. Subscriptions at the bottom only to trigger. So it's because it's lazy, you couldn't change all of the app. All right. So the response observable maps over the URL, creates a local URL session, uh, and expects a JSON value back, which is that extension. That's also part of RxCoco. Just gives me JSON string from GitHub. So it sort of, sort of passes it into an any object which represents JSON. And uh, you'll notice that there's, I've got the switch latest here. So what is it actually doing? At this point, I'll just put that there. If you notice, at that point, it's uh, the value inside that observable is another observable, because the local URL session that RxJSON returns another observable that you can actually then call to get the response. So it's sort of like an array within an array. So what do you do when you have an array within an array? You flat map over it. That's exactly what's happening here. So if I just remove the switch latest and flat map here, it sort of unwraps the internal array, and then you, you're, it's passing the observable outside, outside it. So that's that's what's happening here, and you've actually got it's type check, and obviously you get your value at the end. So if I just hit the refresh button, you've got the click. It's getting the data, and that is just a small representation of what the actual data is. Um, that's coming through this loading GitHub. API in a second. So just ignore this for a second. That's just using Argo in Swift to parse the JSON and get a struct that we can use. Um, it's sort of similar to the Argonaut talk from 
last month that uh, George gave. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other session on its own. And then you'll notice there's a shared replay here. So what is that for? You, uh, you mentioned the uh, values before where you can have, um, you can sort of cache buffer five values at once, or one value in this case. Share replay effectively shares the subscription from that point on. So if, say, five subscriptions are listening in on this particular observable, everyone will just use a shared value. Especially with HTTP requests, this is important because otherwise you'll be making five HTTP requests because they're all immutable and lazy. Uh, every time a subscription is made, it's, it creates a new HTTP request. I'll actually show you what happens. I'll comment that out and uh, go up here. Yeah. I'll just go to the GitHub API example. We've got some subscriptions there. I'll just hit refresh. You'll notice it's loaded GitHub data three times because there's three views here on the screen. And for each of those views, it's because they all depend on the same set of data, it's made three different requests uh, with the share replay. Uh, yeah. With the share replay, that gets effectively shared at that point onwards. All right, so what's actually happening? You'll notice that it still doesn't render anything on the screen. Um, so I'll hit the refresh button and I'll hit the X button. And something's loaded in just that one spot. So what's actually happening there? Um, then I'm, I'm, I'm calling it because let's just look at suggestion one observable for a second. So what am I what I'm actually doing there is I've created a function called create suggestion and I'm passing the, the first close button to it. Now, when the close button is clicked, I'm combining that click with the latest value from response, which is here, which is shared at this point. And you have a resultant selector where it just takes the, the users <coughs> array, which is an array of users you got from GitHub, picking a random member from there, and then just sort of returning that as a value. And that value is then again shared at this point, sort of not necessary. Uh, actually, I will remove that. And that's how you're getting that. So every time I click, it's loading a new value from the responses uh, JSON role that you get from GitHub. So that when I hit the refresh button, it's loading a new data set, and then this works as usual. Now, you'll notice that when I actually hit the refresh button, the previous data set doesn't actually, just instantly clear out. I hit it, when the new data comes in, it sort of places it there. So that's not really good UI. What you want to do is when you hit the refresh button, you want the whole thing to clear out and then place the new ones as they load. So that's what the merge here does. Um, so I'll just take, just get rid of that. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking the refresh observable, the original button click when you actually press the refresh button. And I'm taking, it, it returns an optional user item. So a user item here is just a struct that returns the URL, the URL for their avatar and their username, which is represented as login in GitHub's API. Um, so there you go. Yeah, so I'm taking, when the refresh button is hit, it's all, all it does is sort of sends a nil back. That's what that does. So you hit the refresh button, it sends a nil. Because it's an optional, it, you, in Swiftland, nil is just a null value. And so then, because it's an optional, it sees the nil, and the sub subsequent function sees it as a nil and just clears out the view. So let's just try that out. I'll leave that there. I'll run the sequence. And I hit the refresh button. And I still need to click that because they don't they're not triggered by themselves at this point. And I hit that, plays it up, places a new set of values. Now, what we need at this point is, obviously, when I actually go to the API, I don't want it to be empty. I don't want it to save that. It needs to be pre-populated with some sort of value. So what I do for that is sort of start the observable by giving it a starting value. Now, you'll notice that I've actually mapped everything to return strings, so the type of observable of the value that it expects at this point is just a string. Um, so what I actually do to trigger this, uh, trigger these clicks is just put a dot start with, with uh, here. 
and say pull the trigger event. Now let's copy and paste that everywhere. And there's also a start bit on the refresh button because unless you trigger the observable somehow, you start it with a value, there's no way it'll run. So if, you're, if you expect the user to go and hit the refresh button on the page to trigger the observable, nothing's going to happen. So if I actually just do that, what you'll see is I go to the API page and it actually does all the, all of the stuff. So all of the observables are running now. There's data coming in. It, it automatically assumes to have pressed, someone's assumed to have pressed the, pressed the refresh button and the data's loaded. So I hit the refresh again. It's a new set of data. I can close one in, one person here. There you go. Now, um, all, all of this code is rather unnecessarily you know, complex, but I'll actually just explain what these two things do. So that, uh, in Rx and if, in every Rx implementation, you've got something known as the subscribe on and observe on. In Rx, in Swift and in iOS in general, you have to actually explicitly specify which thread that any piece of code runs in. That's what the this stuff does. So in iOS, you need all UI changes to happen in the main thread, but all the processing of getting data, HTTP request, all to happen in the background thread. So that's what this does. So when I call it dot subscribe on, what it effectively means in RX speak is everything before it, so all the stuff gets run on the background dispatch scheduler, which is just a background thread that I sort of created. And the observe on means the, subscri the actual subscription underneath it runs in the main thread. So observe on, so it's a bit counterintuitive. Observe on means where it's actually, or where the output is run, which is the subscription, and subscribe on means where the actual logic is run. So if I say, for example, change this to the background, it's bad scheduler everywhere, you'll notice, there we go. It's not loading any data, and it probably will at some point. I hit that, it's not doing anything. Because it's we're trying to change, apply UI changes on the background thread, and the whole thing sort of falls apart. And it, it eventually does it, but it throws an error in the console when it does, saying that you can't do this on the main thread, which will cause an exception. So. That's what the subscribe on main and observe on does. Um, you are, you have to sort of be explicit with which thread you're running on. Most of the time, uh, many other libraries in Swift and many other React libraries are automatically do this for you by switching between threads and so on. In RFC, you have to be very explicit, and in every subscription you actually do, you have to sort of mention it. So it's more code that you have to write, but at least you know exactly what's happening with the uh, thread and so forth. So. Uh, that's pretty much how the most of this example works. So it's it's most of it's you know very technical, and most of these operators that I'm actually using, which is combined latest and stuff, you can actually see it in um, reactivex.io. There's a section called doc in the docs. There's a section called operators, and you'll actually see this fair few of them, and you can use them to mix and match create and do whatever you want with these streams modes and, and you know obviously do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, very quickly let me just give you a demo of what actually happened is how you actually create an observable. So I'll just go to the Rx notification one. So that's effectively what it is. This is the native iOS way of calling listening on a notification. All it's doing is it's adding an observable for the name um, and uh, it's subscribing to the notification, listening to the notification here, and then calling dot next for every instance of the notification that comes through, which is what that does. And then when you call the dispose function on it, it just removes the observer and problem solved. It's, uh, it's all taken care of within the observable contract that is introduced in Rx. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any other, oh, actually, good point. Uh, this is sort of what it actually, the end result of the GitHub API page is supposed to look like. 
Um, when I hit the close button, it takes the latest value from the response observable because you're using combined latest. Uh, if this value doesn't exist, it sort of waits until someone presses the refresh button and then loads this value, at which point it creates a suggestion and then you, you've got the data at, the, at that point, which is then rendered on the UI. So the, this model, I, I couldn't actually, I tried to sort of represent what the logic that's happening in that view with a model diagram. I think I sort of failed. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's sort of hard to represent it. I, I tried. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to get, a, get a, a much better understanding of what's actually happening here if you actually you know, understand what specific operators do. So I'm actually not even using that many. All I'm using is flat map and combine layers and, and so on. So it's sort of a very basic set of operators. But uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, any questions? Is there a way to automate getting rid of the disposable? Because I think I would forget like sometimes the call disposable. Uh, yeah, which the actually to be honest, the automation is the add disposable too. There's no other manual, I mean, auto, more automatic way apart from actually adding macros and stuff that actually do it for you. Uh -huh. um, but that being said, you can actually put the add disposable tool everywhere. Uh, I just don't have it, and the code doesn't do any harm because in certain cases you won't actually need the dispose. You won't need to explicitly do that. Yeah. Say for example, I put in a um, dot take just five here. So what it'll have, what will happen is after it will take five values and then close itself after that. So it's pretty deep at the bottom. And it, go to the notification disposal example. It's taking, it's going to take five values and then sort of complete itself. So in these scenarios like this, you won't actually need the add disposable too, but there's no harm in putting it there. So you can just, you might as well just make it a habit to put it at the end of every observable, and lo and behold, you've got sort of self-disposing observables. It's not self-disposing, but you know, you get what I mean. Um, there's just one fact I so, sort of forget, forgot to mention, um, which is if you have this as map. One of the more, the most important problem that you have with networking related code is when you make two requests, when you trigger two requests to the same set of, to the same API, you don't know which one's going to come back first. For example, an auto complete widget, for example, uh, which is effectively what this GitHub API is doing. It's just hitting an API and trying to get data back. So when I hit this refresh button, quickly, what will happen in a typical networking request is going to go and fetch the data and just discard it because you already pressed that refresh button again, it's going to fetch the next one, and you have no guarantee of which order it's coming back in. Because I'm using uh, dot map dot switch latest, which is effectively flat map latest, which is, it takes only looks at the latest value and ignores all of the old values, it's actually going to cancel all of the HTTP requests that it doesn't need. So for example, if you're using RxJS and you're using it in the browser, you have an autocomplete widget. As you're typing, it's making a request and instantly canceling it if you're not waiting for, say, two seconds or whatever. And that sort of means you just ignore values that you never, and you never get values that you don't need because it's disposing itself. So that's one of the advantages. Yeah. Sort of a lot mentioned that. But. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. where does the disposal for HTTP? Uh, when you move away from the view, so it's they all they're all attached to the one subscription at the bottom. So when that subscription is disposed, everything else on, that it's connected to is disposed. Because there's no explicit subscription for the HTTP itself, right? So, yeah. oh, when you repeatedly really press the fresh button, does it cancel all the other? Yeah, it cancels all the. Yeah, that's what you actually see uh, uh, here. That's it. Can trying to cancel. So I'll just smash this in for a bit. And you'll sort of notice it's canceling every request that it's tried. So, yeah. so uh, I noticed you've got this UI view and then you've got uh, your um, observable within that and mm -hmm. then at the end you're um, doing some UI stuff. Yeah. Is it possible to extend the scope of that signal so, to, so as to define the view itself as part of the observable? Yes, you can. So there's in RX Swift there's something known as a bind to, which means which is actually I, I would have actually run through it, but it's, since it's very stiff specific, I actually didn't mention it. But yeah, what will happen there is you can actually bind to an element, and what will happen is it will as it, as it sees a value, it sort of binds 
the output of that one observable into the value of the actual UI element, mm -hmm. and you then you don't actually have to even subscribe or add the disposable tool because the binary takes care of all of that. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's an example on the RX Swift page um, mm -hmm. that sort of highlights it. There it is. That's an example of it binding straight That's to it. Small community. Can you zoom in, please? Oh. Yeah. My poor arms. So that's actually binding straight to another label text field. And there you go. So obviously, I'm putting in subscriptions to sort of make it explicit as to what's happening, but yeah, you can bind to straight to another field. And, and it, that will take care of disposing and everything, so you don't actually manually have to do anything at all. This time. Yeah, I'm slightly curious, how does Reactive Swift compare to Reactive Scala? Uh, side by side. I actually don't know, simply because I'm not, I don't really work much with Scala, but um, most of the operators and almost all of the behavior is well documented. So Rx was originally written in .NET. And it's just been ported from .NET to all the other languages, but they all have to maintain the same spec. So the behavior should be consistent among all these implementations, and if they're not, we have a problem. So the Reactive X, the, the parent organization, sort of only adds languages into its pack, into its fold when they actually match the spec. So Rx Swift was only added a couple of months ago, and it's been in development for close to six to seven months. So yeah, that's that's it. Anything else? Cool. Cool. Thank you.